ونستعين ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد قال تعالى ولا عصر ان الانسان لفي خسر الا الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر we begin by praising allah we praise him we seek his help and we ask for his forgiveness and we take refuge with allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions anyone whom allah guides no one can misguide but anybody whom allah leaves to go astray no one can guide and i testify that allah alone is worthy of worship and that muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam may the peace and blessings be of allah be upon him is the worshiper of allah and his messenger allah says in the quran by time the meaning of which is by time allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he swears by time time my brothers which is running out our time is limited our time on this earth is finite in reality my brothers we are just like one of those insects they live for a day they live for a day it's our life we are here just but for a moment and this moment that we have everybody is lost inna al-insana lafi Verily, Allah is definitely, this is an emphasis, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is emphasizing that definitely, most certainly, everybody is lost. Except, illa ladina amanu, except those who have iman, wa amilu salihat, and they do righteous actions, they do good deeds. But this is not enough, my brothers. Because in order for us to be successful, in order for us not to be of those who are lost, we also need tawasu bil sabr, wa tawasu bil haq, wa tawasu bil sabr. We need to join together and work together and cooperate together to teach the truth. And this teaching of truth, brothers, this is the hallmark. Of this nation you know what is the hallmark when you have a piece of silver or something that is made of gold there is a mark on it and the mark on the silver and the gold guarantees its authenticity so the guarantee of the authenticity of the Muslim is not just Iman and the Amin Saleh it is something else on top of this, it is that we are the people who enjoy what is right and we forbid what is wrong. This is the characteristic of this Ummah. It is this characteristic that makes us the best of nations. And when we do not have this characteristic anymore, when we abandon this characteristic, then we don't have the right and the entitlement to be considered the best of all nations. We don't have that right. We don't have that characteristic. Us being the best of nations is conditional. It is conditional. On this criterion. And the other thing we need to understand. That when it comes to Iman. And when it comes to Amil al-Saleh. And when it comes to tawasu bil haq, none of this can be accomplished except with a quality of willpower. What is willpower? 
I'm using a modern psychological term. Maybe we are more familiar with the term sabr. But in modern psychology, they have a term, they call it willpower. And what is willpower? Willpower is the ability, the ability to delay gratification, to control your nafs. Really, this is what it means. The ability to control your impulses and your desires in order to reach a long-term goal. Now, there was an experiment that was done in the 1970s by a man called Walter Michel. He was a psychologist in Stanford University. And he did an experiment which has become so famous with children. And what he did was he gave these children some marshmallows and he left them in a room. He said, you can have this marshmallow right now. If you want to eat it, you can have it right now. But if you wait some time, you can have two marshmallows. You just have to wait a bit. If you wait a bit, you will get two. You can have the one now, no problem. If you wait a bit, you can have two. And then they left the room. And they wanted to see the original purpose of the experiment was to find out what strategies and what techniques the kids would employ in order to be able to avoid eating the marshmallow straight away and to get an extra marshmallow. But of course, some children didn't wait. Some children ate the marshmallow straight away. And some children waited. And yes, they employed different strategies, different techniques to try and avoid them eating that marshmallow. Some of them picked it up, smelt it, even they tasted it, put it down. Others were looking somewhere else, trying not even to look at it. So they, they, they used all these different techniques. But some children, they ate the marshmallow. Now here's the amazing thing. This man, his daughters were in the same school as the children who were in the experiment. And the daughters would come home and they would be telling their dad, this kid did this, this kid dad that did that, this kid got in trouble, this kid uh, didn't finish the homework. And as they were growing up, this psychologist realized that there was a correlation, a connection between the kids who had eaten the marshmallow. Okay, so some kids, they ate it. They didn't delay. And what he found was the kids who were not able to control themselves throughout their whole lives, and they followed these children for many, many years until they became adults, and they found consistently that those who are not able to control themselves, to delay gratification, they were more likely to go to prison, more likely to drink alcohol, more likely to take drugs, they had a lower income, they were more likely to lose their jobs or have low-end jobs. When they had relationships, their relationships were more likely to fail. And here's the amazing thing, in the field of psychology, there are very few things that happen as a child that can predict the behavior or how you're going to be as an adult. Even things like, you know, abuse, sexual abuse, being beaten, many different things. Children go through many positive and negative things. Very few of them predict how a child is going to turn out as an adult. Except this one thing. The ability to control yourself. Self-discipline. Sabah. The ability to have sabr is the single most reliable predictor of how a person will behave as a child, as a child, how they will be when they are an adult. Now here's the beautiful thing you have to understand. Is that, as in all things real, alhamdulillah, it's not fixed. If you are a person, you think you have no self-control, you can learn self-control. You can learn it, you can acquire it. It is a characteristic that you can learn and you can acquire. And this is something we know from Islam. Sabr is something that we can learn. It is a characteristic that we can acquire. Not only, of course, by making dua, but by practicing it. And this is the interesting thing you find your ulama when they talk about how you get sabr, by practicing sabr. Actually, this is, in, this is exactly what modern psychologists are saying. The same thing. Your brain is very flexible. Your brain has the ability to learn and acquire and develop new habits. 
This is very important. Uh, why am I saying this? Because the path of da'ya, the path of calling to Allah, the path of tawasu bil haqq, of enjoining what is right and forbidding what is wrong, and calling to truth and forbidding evil, it needs sabr, it needs patience. You need to have this ability to control yourself. So I want to give you an amazing story. You all know the story. But it's truly amazing. It's a story of dawah and it's a story of the most amazing sabr. And it is a story of someone who had the most excellent character on a, a level that is barely imaginable for us today. But it is something we must all aspire to. And I hope this story will inspire all of us to be more committed to one of the most important obligations in Islam, and that is the obligation of Amr bin Ma'ruf wa Nahin al munkar of inviting and calling people to Islam, whether they are Muslim or non-Muslim. It's something, unfortunately, I think, especially when it comes to the field of da'wah to non-Muslims, it is very neglected. Yes, alhamdulillah, there are organizations and, uh, that are dedicated to this, but what I, it's not something that is in the mentality or the daily life of everyday Muslims. It is not something that the, every Muslim cares about, puts their energy and time into, or even thinks about in reality. And I believe this is one of the big causes of our decline and our bad situation we find ourselves in today. Because we have forgotten this obligation. But it's this obligation that actually defines us as a nation. If we have forgotten it, we're not the best of men. And look at us, we're not the best. Who are we the best? No, we are on the bottom of the heap. We are doing all our best to imitate the West. If we were the best, they would be imitating us. We're not. Everything you can imagine, they are advanced more than us. Even in simple things like, you think the things that the Muslims would be best about, caring for other human beings, making sure that they have their rights, treating people with justice and fairness. You think the Muslims would be the most advanced. No, no, no. We find that the West has to lecture us about how we treat our workers in our countries. And they have to impose on us rules and regulations. We didn't make them up for ourselves. No, no, we'd be happy to treat everyone like a slave and give them nothing. Take their passports, take their work, take everything, and you know, send them back to where they went from with nothing. We'd be happy. This is how thoughtless we are. The West has to lecture us on the fundamental things you think a Muslim above everything would care about justice and kind treatment of people, even, especially, not even, especially if they are non-Muslim. Because we know that would open their hearts to Islam. This is how backward we are. These are, these are deeny things, not dunya things, even in things that to do with morals, akhlaq. The West has to teach us. This is our situation. Okay, maybe we have some things. It's true, maybe, alhamdulillah, when it comes to family life. I agree. One of the few things left. Family life still, alhamdulillah. We care for our families better than most people in the West. Oh, that's true. But very few things left. Anyway, this is not the main focus. I want to mention this beautiful story. So we all, I'm sure you all know the story of the Prophet Wasallam going to Taif. Now I want to put this in context. You have to remember that Rasulullah has spent many, many years now in Mecca calling the people to Islam. And also you have to remember that a Prophet, a messenger is not allowed to leave calling his people until Allah gives him permission. So the Prophet ﷺ couldn't leave Mecca to go to another place until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed him to do that. He has to wait for the permission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course Rasulullah is finding, as we know, 
The people of Mecca are very hard, very tough. The response from them is very little. The numbers of Muslims are so few, <laughs> fewer, than, fewer than this room. 70 people maybe. I mean, the numbers are so, can you imagine? Rasulullah, he's the messenger of Allah. And just a few people have accepted Islam. 70 people. It's nothing. And even they are being persecuted and their life is so hard. So now you can imagine when Allah gives permission to the Prophet ﷺ to go and call the people of Ta'if to Islam. I don't know this for sure, but I am just imagining how, what is the Prophet ﷺ thinking? He must, I am thinking that he must be thinking the reason why Allah is letting me go to Ta'if to call the people to Islam is because they are the people who are going to accept Islam. They are the ones who are going to carry the message. So I'm imagining that Rasulullah is going there full of optimism and hope and expectation that Allah has let me go to Ta'if because these people are going to accept Islam. So he goes to Ta'if. So as it was the custom of the Prophet ﷺ, his methodology, first he will go to the leaders. So he went first to the leaders and he begins to talk to them. In fact, he doesn't talk to them because none of them want to see him. They all refuse to even meet Rasulullah except one. And this one, he just actually he makes fun of the Prophet. He says, you're too dangerous. I can't deal with you. You're too dangerous. If you're a Prophet, it's too dangerous. If you're not, it's too dangerous. So I, I don't want to deal with you. So then what does the Prophet do? Does he give up? According to some of the books of Sirah, brothers, listen to this. According to some of the books of Sirah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he spent 10 days in Ta'if knocking on the door of every single house. Every single house knocking on the door. And no one, no one responds to his call. And he is the best guy. He is the best caller to us. No one can be better die than him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ten days knocking on every door. And no one, no one, this is sabr. No one accepts Islam. So then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam leaves. But this is not the end. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is leaving, the leaders of Ta'if, they say to the children, you know the, the children running on the street, stone him. Throw stones at him, pelt him, you know, get, get rid of him, throw, throw stones and hasten his exit. So the children and, you know, the good for nothings, they are throwing stones at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa throwing stones. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as the stones are hitting him, he's bleeding. Bleeding so much that the blood is pouring down his legs and the sandals, his sandals, subhanAllah. The, the sandals are sticking to the feet of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi The blood is making the sandals stick to his feet. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is walking and walking away from Taif in this condition. Then subhanAllah, he reaches the bottom of the mountain, he finds a garden. He sits there in a, you know, this state. And really all he's worried about is really, did he do something displeasing to Allah? Did he say something wrong to the people? Did he fail to convey the message in the best way? This is, you know, this is how the Prophet, this is his dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Jibreel, Jibreel comes. He says, Ya Muhammad, just give the order, the angel of the mountain will crush and destroy this town. Just give the word and the angel of the mountains will destroy Ta'if utterly. And the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, what does he say? He says, no, don't do that. Because maybe from their children will be people who will become Muslim. Maybe from their children will be people who become Muslim. Yeah, I want, I really want my brothers 
You know, if you are one of these people who are obsessed with violence and jihad and bombing and killing, I, I am appealing to you, brothers, please. If you know someone like that, I'm appealing to you, please. Think about, think about this. Think about Rasulullah. If you care about Islam, if you care about, you truly love Rasulullah, you truly love Islam, please. This is not Islam. Islam is not bombing and killing and slaughtering and revenge. This is not Islam. Yes, maybe you feel hard done by for whatever reason. But look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You see, this is our problem, brothers. This is our problem, brothers. How do we think about Islam? We don't think about the beauty of Islam. This is the care of Rasulullah. Rasulullah does not want people to be destroyed. He wants them to have light and he wants them to have life. He wants them to have Islam. That is his care. He just needs to give the word. And the angel will destroy this town. But no, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi don't do that. Maybe their children will be Muslim. This is Islam. Even if we fight and we have to fight, if it comes to that, we only do it because we want people to be guided. We only are the, we're not doing it for land and power and politics and greed. No. For one thing. That's to let people know. Truly la ilaha illallah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa la alihi wa Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa la alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. I want to then reflect a little bit more on the story of Taif. Because I hope everybody in this masjid today, listening to this khutbah, I want you to ask yourself, do you really love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Do you love Rasulullah? If you do not love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more than your mother, and I was just talking to the brother who brought me here today, and he was telling me his parents are more beloved to him than his wife and his children. Is Rasulullah more beloved to you than your mother? More beloved to you than your father? More beloved to you than your children? Than your business? Than your country? Than yourself? Your own self? Because as you know, Umar ibn al-Khattab, he said, Ya Rasulullah, I love you more than everyone and everything except myself. He said, no. If you don't love me more than yourself, you haven't got true Imam. He said, then Ya Rasulullah, I love you more than myself. He said, now Umar, now. So you have to love, to have, to perfect your Iman. And I'm sure if I ask you, you would say, oh yes, I love Rasulullah more than myself. Really? Okay, it's easy to put your hand up. It's easy to say words. But what's the reality? Here's the reality. If you love Rasulullah more than you love yourself, that means you would rather that you were being pelted with stones. It was rather you went to Taif, and you would rather that it was you that got rejected on every door. And it was rather you that you got pelted with stones. You would say, I prefer that those stones hit me. And that rejection was given to me than it was to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa That's the reality. That's what it means. You would rather be in his place. You would rather that, that you suffered that than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa suffered that. But I want you to think, what did Rasulullah care about? If you say you love him, then you have to love what he loves. You have to care about what he cares about. You have to give your life to what he gave his life to. It's the reality. So if you don't care about people coming to Islam, if that is not more important to you than revenge, if you are not ready to suffer humiliation, both mental and physical, for the sake of the truth, tawasso bil haqq, you don't love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Your claim is an empty claim. You don't love him more than yourself. It's just something you say. Inshallah, you aspire to. I'm not saying you don't want to, but it's not a reality. Because this is the Sahaba. Really in reality. There's a, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was on an expedition and he was going to go and fight jihad, a woman comes running. He says, Ya Rasulullah, take my child. Take my child. Take my baby. He says, what am I going to do with your baby? He says, Ya Rasulullah, you can use him as a shield in the battle. He 
see, these people really love the Prophet more than they love their own children. This is the reality of Islam and Iman. So, uh, this beautiful story is a story of the most amazing character, the character of forgiving, of overlooking, of compassion, of caring for guidance for people, he, the love for da'wah, the love that people, which should be, this is what, even if you read Surah Al-Kahf, read the Surah Al-Kahf, I'm sure you all read it today. What does it say in Surah Al-Kahf? That, you know, Muhammad, maybe you will, you will die because people are not, uh, not accepting this Qur'an. This is how the Prophet, he, he, this feeling that he wanted, he's dying out of worry and concern. He's feeling, this is how he's feeling, because people are not accepting this message of Islam. This is his concern, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is his life. This should be our concern and our life. And I want to finish. I want to, to finish with uh, some, a final thought. Something amazing. Really beautiful. That th this story ends on something amazing. The story of Taif. Now you know the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said to Jibreel, no, maybe from there... Descendants will be people who will be guided to Islam. So now some scholars, some ulama, they, they looked into this. And of course, you know, all the people in the Arabian Peninsula became Muslim. But they looked into the people of Ta'if. They looked into the generation. So that, you know, so that he said, maybe from their children will be people who were guided to Islam. So they began to look into the biographies and the lives and the descendants of these people. And they found that from their descendants, from their children, I think they found something like 900 ulama. 900 ulama from the descendants, from the children of the people of Taif at that time. SubhanAllah. You see, this is Southern. Not always, brothers, you will see the results of your efforts. Maybe even in your life, you will not see the results of your efforts. But this is, you have to believe that, look, I have to make the effort. I have to make, I, I have to make the effort. I have to do the actions. I have to fulfill my obligations. Whether I see the result or not, is not in my hands. Allah is the one who guides. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to see from us brothers. He wants to see from us that effort. So I am really inviting and imploring all of you. For, for the sake of Allah, for the sake of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi for loving the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And for the sake of the ummah of Muhammad. For our present and future condition. Believe me, unless we change ourselves, we will keep on being in this situation. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's a hadith, it is Sahih, it's a Hassan, collected in Tirmidhi. You must enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong. You must enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong. Or else Allah will send upon you a calamity. He will send upon you a calamity. And you will make dua and it will not be accepted. This shows that failing to give da'wah and to call to truth and forbid evil is a cause for our destruction. So brothers, fill your life with this good action. It is an obligation from amongst the obligations in Islam. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we implore Allah and we beg Allah from the bottom of our heart to make us from those people who enjoy what is right and who forbid what is wrong. To make us from those people who truly love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Brothers, you have to understand that if you love something, you can't help but call people to that thing. If you truly love something, it will come from your heart, from your innermost being that you will want people to also join with you in this thing. This is the nature of the human beings. Even when you love something evil, unfortunately, when people love an evil thing and they love it, they want to get other people to join them in it. Whether it's good or evil, this is our nature. So, you know, if we truly love Islam, we will not be able to contain ourselves from inviting people to it. But really, it, it takes some knowledge. 
Basira. Qul hadihi sabili. Addu Allah ala basira. Ana wa man atabani. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet to say. So we need to learn as well how to give da'wah, the best way to call. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us sincere in our actions and sincere in our attempt to learn and understand how can we fulfill this very important obligation. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help and guide the Ummah of Muhammad. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide our enemies to Islam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to, to fill this world with the light and the guidance of Islam and Al-Iman. It is as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Islam will enter every home. Islam will enter every home, every country, every town, every village, every city, every home. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those people who will be the vehicle through which Islam will enter every home. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa la alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa aqimus.